Hi, this is Brad Sanders again, and we are doing part two of the interview with Bill Needlesayer about the book I'm Dying Up Here, <laughs> High Times in Stand-Up Comedy's Golden Era. So, sit back, relax, or gulp down your coffee and do whatever you do, do your treadmill. But check this out, it's a very interesting book, and I hope it's an interesting interview, but it's all about telling you about this book. All the young people in your life who want to be stand-up comedians need to get this book and check it out. Hope you enjoy it. Well, what started that whole thing was Jay and Tom had been opening in Las Vegas for like Sammy Davis and um, Frank Sinatra respectively. Well, actually Tom opened for Sammy Davis first and Jay opened for somebody and, and I think Sammy Davis as well. But they came back from the same size room as Missy had in right. the back, making $10,000 a week, and then all of a sudden, here they realize, you know, in one shocking moment, that <laughs> they've been had. Well, because, I mean, here's, here's a room in the back, the main room, they called it, which was 560 seats or something like that, and Missy was getting that for free. And the same size room in Vegas allowed them to make 10 grand a week. Right, and what was interesting is when they just, when they decided to do this, when particularly Tom and Jay, who 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 didn't really need the money, right. uh, they they decided to 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 rep, you know uh, ask for money on behalf of the people who weren't making that money, who were living out of their cars and you know eating eating uh, meals at the buffet <laughs> at the bar. You know? Because Tom Dresden yeah. was one of those people who had been living out of his car. Right, exactly, and he remembers. Checks. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you know, I was I always thought that the co the comics had right on their side. It was it was whatever Mitzi thought to have a a, a booming uh, nightclub where the performers are not getting paid just didn't make any sense. Uh, especially if they minded it, if, <laughs> <laughs> if they don't no longer tolerate it, yeah. if, if they didn't care, all well, that's a whole different story. But they apparently cared. <laughs> so what was interesting though is when it, and so I wrote about it all back thirty years ago, and then when I went back, you know, uh, later to to write the book, uh, people were more open about stuff. Uh, and they, they told you things that they didn't tell you back then when it was happening because they were in the middle of their careers and they were struggling. You said, and now they didn't have, you know, so you, you got you got richer material from them. You got, yeah, well, how, they, yeah, well, how rich is this material that you're talking about to read? <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's, it's nothing salacious in that, in that sense. It's just that they have more, uh, they had, it was all going on right at the moment. You were in the middle of the war. The bullets were bouncing off the walls back then, you know, when this was going on. You know, viewed from middle age, they had more understanding about what they what they went through and what it meant to their lives. They didn't have that perspective while it was going on. Um, well, I don't know. Uh, well, first They of knew all, it was they, unfair. Well, they knew but, it was unfair, but one of the main things we had to do is convince comics that they should, you know, stand up for themselves. Someone didn't think and, they should. You know, right? they, they, they didn't think they had a right to, yeah. they were afraid to, they thought yeah. it would damage their careers, and we had to really remind them of the labor movement in the United States of America which is what made this whole thing possible. And the thing that broke the co the uh, comedy stores back is when the Teamsters honored our picket line. Right, and they wouldn't they wouldn't deliver the liquor. They just put it on the sidewalk, and they had to haul it in. You know, <laughs> so that that made them stand up and, and uh, no, it was. I remember when the strike started, uh, and I actually I was I was guilty of it myself. I'd been covering you know comedy, and and all of a sudden the comics were oh, boy, there's a strike at the comedy, so there's a picket line, and the whole idea of Stand-up comedians on a picket line picketing. You, there's a lot of humor in there. Yeah. You go, what is that? Come on. <laughs> yeah, right. And pretty much the first. How you strike a job is you don't get paid for it anyway. Right. And the first night, <laughs> and the first night, the first rush of coverage, which was about the only uh, broad coverage it got. Everybody kind of played it for laughs. I mean, it was like, can you please a bunch of clowns walking the picket line? La 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 la. You know. <laughs> and I remember uh, the next night, I was back you know, the picket line again, covering it, because I was in it for the whole thing. And I remember, and, I, and this is in the book, uh, Elaine Boosler walked up to me, and, and she was irritated that, of all people, the LA Times had played it sort of for laughs. And she walked up to me, and she poked me in the chest and basically chewed me out and said, you know, these people out here on the line are risking everything. You don't understand that. This is not, this is no joke. You know, they're, they're, they may never work here again if this doesn't work out. So you should, you should really 
you know, have more respect for it and really find out the issues. And she dressed me down, and I was like, wow, okay, yeah. And that sort of sobered me up. And I, you know, after that, I did look into it more and, you know, went, you know, a little bit more in depth and understood the issues rather yeah. than just, it wasn't just a one night photo op. It was real. It was the yeah, real it was, deal. It was a pretty cold game, man. Yeah. You know, uh, one of the, um, I, you know, everybody just got on our side like you wouldn't believe. And George Miller's mother was a bookkeeper for the comedy store. Yeah. And she knew. She knew that. She knew the money that was coming in there. And she just thought it was disgusting. And she became our bookkeeper, the right. American Federation of Comedians. Well, that's, that's, that's in the book. And, yeah, and okay. uh, when all well, of a sudden, when, when, yeah, when, all of a sudden all when all of a sudden in, in uh, the, the lawyers for the comics started telling Mitzi exactly how much she was making, she figured out where that information was coming from. And she fired George's mom. Mm -hmm. You know, she put two and two together. Now, wait a minute. Someone's telling Who could tell them? Yeah, well, that's what she did. So, yeah. yeah. Um, well, one day, because I used to work at the comedy store, yeah. too. One day, I actually saw the ledger. Oh, what? Oh, wow. What is it? I saw, well, the ledger said how much money was being made. Right. And the Westwood Club. Right. How much money was being made in the comedy store. You know, on Sunset. Right. And they were making. Which like, set of books was it, though? <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know if they were cooked or uncooked, yeah. but it was believable because, I mean, if you, you know, the, the drinks, you're talking about back in 74, 79, they started charging seven bucks, eight bucks for drinks. Wow, that's what Yeah, they were charging, yeah. And I was they, a reporter, I never paid for a drink. Well, there, it was, you know? well I didn't either, but I knew the bartender, and I knew yeah. how much stuff cost, and the most expensive thing you could pour. In a bar was uh, in that bar was Martell, and that cost you about thirty-five cents. And uh, but the books that I saw, she was. I'm looking at a figure like about two point five. Yeah, she was doing all right. She's she was doing, doing real good. Yeah, she was doing all right. Yeah. But uh, uh, but you know, but viewed back, you know, years later, um, you know, I, people weren't quite so pissed at her. As they, some of them are, but 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 they they they, they saw it through a, a softer softer focused lens than they did at the time, um, and uh, you know for whatever for whatever whatever else you could say about her and what she did or what she didn't do, uh, she did provide she did build that club she did make it into something and it certainly represented something for a long time it doesn't anymore uh, and. If you talk to Mitzi now, you know, she still talks about the store. She doesn't talk about comedy. She doesn't talk about the art. She talks about the store. You know, which well, that's is what she always I talked she about. Was, there was nothing else in her <laughs> mind but the store. This little retail establishment that she built. Yeah, yeah the privilege. Look, yeah. look, you can't take away her business acumen. And, and the fact that she got it in a divorce settlement for, from her husband. That's right. Okay, She fine. made it into she something. She made it into something. Right. But the something she was selling was comedy, and that she never would acknowledge. No, no, that's true. She was. She would actually argue that they come for the ambiance. Yeah, come, they, they, yeah. Come. they come to smell the puke in the coffee. Yeah, that's right. That's yeah. Right. <laughs> but you know what? What? What's interesting though is that the way she. It was sort of a historic com, uh, confrontation because the one thing the comics would always bristle if Mitzi even suggested or thought that she would do anything like to. to to control or change their act, it was like you know, comics are like, don't fuck with my act, don't tell me you know. Blah. Well, you know what? The comedy store was Mitzi's act, and she reacted the same way. When when they asked to be paid, her reaction is, don't you tell me about my business? You know, right, you, right. You, okay. don't say, the psychology is the same. Yeah, you know, that's what she's doing. Nah, <laughs> yeah, I mean, no, you're reaching there, man. <laughs> you are reaching right I there, think bro. Psychologically, it's the same thing, man. You psychologically, know? she was out of her mind. Yeah. <laughs> can, we I say, mean, can we say that on the air? Yeah, can we say that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't fuck with my act, right? Okay. <laughs> but I mean, you know, if you if you talk to Mitch, well, Bud Friedman was the same way. Yeah, <laughs> we're, we're across the table from this guy, and I said. He's, he's, he's citing all these different things he's got to pay for. I said, I got to pay the guy that mops the floor. I got to pay the, the guy that cooks. I got to pay this. I got to pay the boxer. I got to pay say, you wouldn't, and I said to him, you wouldn't need one of them if it wasn't for us. <laughs> you are, we are the people you're supposed to be paying because we make all these other people necessary. He gets up and walks away from the table, you know, and I go, yeah, that an acting lesson well, from Bud it was, it was, You were changing the economy, you I'm know. Messing you with his punchline, yeah. <laughs> you were changing the economy. What, what do you mean we have to pay you to pick that cotton? You know, that's, yeah, what are you nuts? <laughs> on, you think we can run these plantations and pay you too? I don't think well, so. See, we have been through slavery already. 
<laughs> you know, those of us who have it in our history. <laughs> That's right. So we were able to kind of help a little bit. <laughs> that was funny. Well, you, you know, got to at least feed me. <laughs> yeah, but it was it was uh, it was interesting.